Hello, how are you? I had a taco for lunch, and you? Okay, let's see if I can sort this out. Alrighty. Okay, so we are going to talk about um, urban, high-performance urban ecosystems, um, with urban being the key word there. That uh, statistic at the bottom, I think, is pretty impressive. Um, do you know what it is the net increase in Austin per day is? around 110 to 120 per day in Austin moving in. So it just gives you some perspective on our urban ecosystems and what we need to get out of them. So uh, we humans now, homo sapiens, are now an urban species uh, with about 50% of us globally living in urban areas and then in more uh, modernized countries, uh, regions of the world like US and Europe, it's around 80%. Um, we all know that Austin is growing tremendously fast. Um, I think, what's to say, the third fastest in the nation, uh, one of the fastest growing metros in the U.S. And so what that means is that our work is becoming more and more important because the green spaces are changing very rapidly and we want to increase uh, the ecosystem performance or the um, high performance value of those ecosystems. And so, knowing that we're now uh, an urban species, what this means is that our interactions with nature, the benefits or the ecosystem services that we receive from nature, we now are more likely to receive those in the places where we work, in the places where we live, and in the places where we play. And so, unfortunately though, uh, in our quest for sustainability, um, in many of the larger discussions about sustainability, we potentially overlook uh, the potential of our landscapes, and I think um, urban landscapes in particular. And my opinion, and I would love to hear yours on this, but my opinion is that this occurs largely because um, urban landscapes are often seen as being quite small. The site itself is small. Um, the uh, building or sets of buildings can dominate the site and can dominate kind of the brain power of the project team and, and often the budget <laughs> of a project. And um, we are just really beginning to understand uh, what are the ecosystem service benefits that can be gained um, on smaller scale sites and uh, what, more importantly, what are the impacts that um, these smaller landscapes, these urban landscapes can have uh, for good or for bad. And so why not demand more? Let's first, let's talk about the impacts that we know that we're having. Uh, we know that lawn irrigation, this is potable water, consumes a tremendous amount of our water resources. Um, in climates like ours, it uh, can be over 50 to 60%. I don't know the exact number for Austin, do you? Does anyone know the exact number for Austin? Okay, so she said in the summertime it can be in the range of 50 to 60%. Um, invasive species, we know that the vast majority of invasive species that uh, are in our uh, commercial trade were brought here for horticultural reasons. Um, it's the newest, the prettiest moving in. Um, the city of Austin does have, I think, a great um, invasive species management plan. So if you're interested in invasive species, it's a free document where they've identified the document um, and they've identified the invasive species. They also go into detail with how to treat those invasive species, both from an IPM standpoint as well if you have to move on to more detailed chemical uh, methods, which in some, unfortunately, you do. You can find that information there. We also know that stormwater runoff from developed landscapes is now the leading cause of water pollution in urban areas. And when we talk about stormwater runoff, it's very easy in our brains to switch to this sort of scenario where you're thinking, yes, it's coming from the impervious surfaces, it's coming from all the roads, it's coming from all the roofs and the parking lots. But the truth is a tremendous amount of the pollutants that are being picked up are also coming from our landscapes. They're coming from runoff from our lawns um, and other landscapes that are not holding and treating the stormwater on site. And those can be nutrients that are brought in uh, to, to grow the plants. Um, what, what else do you think also shows up in stormwater from um, urban landscapes? There's one that... Fecal, dog poop. Yeah, there's a lot of fecal chloroform in there. Um, and so uh, there's a big concern about uh, people <laughs> you know, touching and getting sick. And so how our stormwater and our landscapes, um, if we can keep them 
if we can keep the water on our site, if we can treat it on our landscape, then we're reducing the impacts that we'll have into our, lo our larger water bodies. So what we're going to do today is think broadly about our developed landscapes and um, hopefully recognize some of their untapped potential. And I think their untapped potential lies in the science of ecosystem services. And how many of you are familiar with the science of ecosystem services? I understand that Jonathan Garner was here this morning. Um, SITES, the Sustainable Sites Initiative, is based on the science of ecosystem services. And, and what it is, basically, ecosystem services is a very wonky and hard big word, uh, which means something that we all know intuitively. It means the goods and the services provided by uh, ecosystems both urban and rural, any ecosystem that sustain and fulfill human life. I believe that this is the key attribute of um, sustainable landscape design, is the provision of ecosystem services. Um, and recently, uh, within the last several decades, scientists have uh, begun to try to value ecosystem services. And the reason for this is because um, in our thinking, in our global thinking, it's often very hard for us to appreciate something that doesn't have a monetary value associated to it. And so, um, not that I think you can put a monetary value on some of these things. However, what we've seen is that the value is twice the global gross national product for the world. And so what we're saying is without these, we're in big trouble. Um, and so it is in our best interest to start thinking about ecosystem services in all landscapes. So historically, one of the reasons we haven't thought about them is, you know, um, the hinterlands, way far yonder, where humans were not necessarily, is where the ecosystem services were generated, right? Um, but now we know, because of the population growth, um, that we have to start thinking about the provision of ecosystem services in our urban landscapes, in our cities, in our suburbs, in our downtown environment. This is the um, courthouse in Chicago, and then also in our residential landscapes. In all of our settings, now there's an opportunity for this. Uh, this is a residential a site certified project by the name of Taylor um, that's in Pennsylvania. If you wanted to look at a residential project that was able to meet site certification, did Jonathan talk about this one today? Yeah, then you could find out more there. Um, so when I'm talking about ecosystem services and bringing them into our urban environments and thinking about them in your design, uh, I think there's a few that specifically um, are important for our climate. And so uh, we'll focus on those today. And that's the global and local climate regulation. And so what we know is that green spaces help control temperatures at both the global and local scale. And by placing, um, very strategically, trees, uh, vines, vegetated structures, we can not only decrease the amount of energy that a building uses, but we can also um, shade uh, surfaces, primarily dark surfaces, that absorb energy during the day, release the energy slowly at night, and create an urban heat island. And so the urban heat island is why, if you were to look at, um, uh, watch the news at night, a weather map, you would see that city is, uh, the city of Austin or any large city across the U.S. is typically about 10 degrees warmer at night than the surrounding rural areas. This is one of the reasons why. And so we care about this because um, when it is warmer at night, what do we need more of that we didn't need before? AC, air conditioning, yeah. We're running, we're running um, energy at night. We're using more energy, running more AC at night that we didn't need before. And then I think the other impact that's equally as important is um, people don't want to be outside when it's hot. They, they are not experiencing nature. They are not enjoying going outside. They're not experiencing their community. They're not taking value of the green space around them. And so by um, very carefully selecting our vegetation where we place it, this is something that all landscapes can, can focus on. Uh, cleansing and storing water. We know that there's a symbiotic relationship between vegetation and soils and soil biota, and all of these things work together to capture and treat pollutants. Um, we also know that simple things like increasing the organic matter of soil by something as simple as 1% um, can largely increase the stormwater um, holding ability of that soil. Uh, we just ended uh, the International Year of the Soils. 2015 was the International Year of Soils. And so the NRCS and others uh, did some pretty amazing work out there around that. So if you haven't checked out those videos and other things, I recommend taking a look at that. When you're looking at water quality and water quantity in soils and vegetation, you can also look at um, green infrastructure. 
So green infrastructure is plants and soils that treat stormwater. That's different than, per se, gray infrastructure, which is typical piped systems. Um, what you're seeing here is an example of a project uh, by Methune in Seattle. Uh, this is one of the case studies in my book. And um, what they're doing is they're collecting the stormwater from the top of the building. They're using some of it to flush the toilets, so it can't be uh, all used to flush the toilets. Uh, then they move it into the landscape. And so what you're seeing there are some urban, essential, essentially urban bioswales is what those are. They're, they're using a different term, bioretention gardens, but it's the same concept as a bioswale. And then pervious paving with the structural soil underneath that can um, help them manage their stormwater. What other benefits does that structural soil provide? to those trees? You're increasing the root volume, right? You're extending the size that the roots can grow, which there's a direct correlation between the um, soil capacity or the soil volume and the size of a tree. Because like, think about a bonsai. Have you seen beautiful little bonsais <laughs> you know, that are our native species? Um, Ulmus crassifolia, I've seen them bonsai this big, that has everything to do with the pot that they're in. It's the same thing with our trees. Increase in soil volume is going to increase the size of the trees. We increase the size of the trees, we can get more stormwater management benefits, we can also get more shade benefits and other things that we're looking for. This is an example of a bioretention garden, rain garden in Portland where they're managing um, the stormwater off of this school. It's really not that large of a garden, it's only 2,000 square feet. Um, but they're managing over 30,000 square feet of impervious surface with it. So this is a very high performance landscape. Um, the reason they're doing this is because it saved an increase in infrastructure for the city of Portland. So it's a double investment. This is my backyard. That's my chicken. That's Dottie. She's kind of bossy. And that's my husband's shed and my husband's green roof. And um, I wanted to show, do you see the, the water on the right? That's what um, the water looks like when it runs off the green roof after a heavy rain and into our cistern. Um, why do you think it's that brown color? What do you think it has in it? You know, the, the green roof um, has quite a bit of compost in it um, because it's, it's a very lightweight and inert material, but then you have to have the compost to provide the nutrients and also some water holding capacity. So basically what's running off of that green roof is compost tea. And so, and this is after that green roof is about two or three years old, it's still doing that. So, you know, there's been um, other flushes before we took these pictures. And so, if you're thinking about a green roof system then, or any stormwater management system, which is including soils, and there's compost in those soils, then you have to realize that you've also put nutrients into that stormwater, right, as it's moving through. And so then, it's important to think about more of a stormwater treatment train system, where you're not going from just one bioretention system um, off the site, but you're moving it through multiple bioretention systems. Maybe you're going from green roof to bioswale to rain garden. You're moving it very, very slowly across the site in these small features that can be um, easily integrated into the design, but that uh, provide many options for you to um, capture all of the water on site and to treat it on site. Pollination and habitat, a huge one. Um, as you um, probably are aware, the monarch is in big trouble, so there's a big push for monarch habitat that I think we're going to see happen at a federal level, at least for the next year. Hopefully, it'll continue on. We do know this is um, Lincoln Park in Chicago. We do know that um, large parks can be a huge stepping stone in urban areas for habitat. This is very similar, could be very similar to our, our Zilker Park in town, where they had a group of uh, citizen science go out and do bird counts, and they found 158 bird species, different bird species. I don't think that's too bad for middle of a city this has a Chicago. Um, but more importantly, what we also know is that there's a bottom-up influence. And so what that means is that we don't just have to look at these very large parks to say that's the habitat in our areas, but our neighborhoods can also be habitat. And yes, there is a benefit from one yard. There is a bird species richness improvement benefit from one yard when uh, the plants are selected and habitat is created. And then what do you think happens when there's two yards? and then three yards, and then four yards. And so that you can begin to think about neighborhoods as these parks that are moving in um, birds and other habitat species. And then, of course, the physical and mental health. And I would imagine that most folks that go into our field of work um, intuitively know this. 
we know that we feel better when we're working in the landscape, and that's part of why we do this work, right? <laughs> well, now um, there's science to back up that uh, it wasn't just a feeling, we're actually on to something. And that uh, it is true that there is physical, mental, social health benefits from being out in nature. And so if you look at neighborhoods with more vegetated green space, um, they found that, the, that participants are more likely to engage in the physical activity, and so they're going to be about 40% less obese. Now, what are other benefits from um, neighbors engaging outdoors? Less crime. That's right. They know each other, community, right? If you know your neighbors outside and someone else is in your neighborhood that you don't know that you haven't seen, well, then you're going to be more vigilant about, well, who is that person? You know, why are they here? Um, what's going on? Um, those sorts of things. And then we also know that um, there is tremendous um, mental uh, regenerative properties, mental respite from um, green space, and that we do see improved concentration not only in adults but in children, positive attitudes, improved productivity, all of these things that make the green space turn back around into dollars, um, real dollars, for, for businesses and municipalities alike. So let's talk about some design solutions. Um, first and foremost, plants are essential to the provision of ecosystem services. Um, if you were looking at a list of ecosystem services, you know, there's lumpers and splitters, and so there's uh, different numbers of ecosystem services that you can come up, but it's very difficult to tease away how they would not be connected to plants in some way. And so if you can think about just the benefits of one tree, um, not only are they absorbing a tremendous amount of air pollutants, but they're also providing the oxygen, increasing the cooling costs, which we heard about, um, increasing property value. I know we purchased our house not because we loved the house, but because it had two great trees on it. And we thought, well, we can change the house, but we are not we're in 60 years, hopefully we're not going to be living here, and these are 70-year-old trees, and so we're good. You know, that's a good place to start. Um, habitat for over 500 insect species. I had somebody once tell me, why in the world would I want to plant a tree? That you told me it's habitat for 500 insect species. Why do you think that's a good number? Why do you think any insect species in your tree is good? Birds and other, habit and other animals, right? Insects are on the bottom. <laughs> They're on the bottom of the food chain. And so if we run the insects out of our landscapes, what in the world is everything else going to eat? And so when you see trees and other species that provide a broad habitat um, for insects, what you're really doing is providing habitat for other wildlife. Um, interception of stormwater. How do trees intercept stormwater? They're leaves. Yeah, up above. And so that, storm, that helps stormwater management in, in two ways. First of all, it's capturing it, and maybe it'll stay on the leaves and, and until it slowly um, evapotranspirates back into the air, right? Or it'll stay there and it'll drip slowly. And if it drips slowly, and it's a very heavy rain event, then your site is more likely to be able to hold that water, right? Um, and so this is why I think we see a large push for um, uh, street trees and why we should continue to see this push and every opportunity you get to shade a tree or to, to shade a street or to cover a um, street with a tree, please do so because there's numerous benefits that go along with that. So when you think about the productivity of um, vegetation and how all ecosystem services are associated with it, you can, there's a general rule of thumb where you can say, okay, well then the more plant species that I have on site, the more plants I have on site, um, the greater benefits. But that's a very quick jump because in some ecosystems you're going to pay dearly for more plant species, right? And so what we have to think about is not just more plant species on site, but how do we construct and maintain those plant species so that when we're trying to balance this ecosystem services or um, with the triple bottom line of the costs, that what we're designing and maintaining in our landscape doesn't undo the ecosystem service benefits that we're trying to create. So example, what is the environmental cost of uh, clearing a landscape? Not only do you lose all the ecosystem services that that vegetation is already providing, but more than likely, if you're using machinery, then there's going to be pollutants 
attached with that, right? And then there's the green waste. That, yes, it can be recycled, but again, it has to be more than likely transported somewhere else when it's going to be recycled. Um, the plant production and transportation. When you're growing vegetation, when anyone is growing vegetation, it takes a certain amount of resources, right? It takes water, it takes fertilizers, it takes nutrients, and then you put it on a truck and you move it from point A to point B. Sometimes they get moved a very, very long ways from point A to point B. So by planting new plants, we're not just breaking even. Then there's the establishment. If you have to guarantee a tree that is healthy and established on a site versus one that you're going to plant new, which one would you want to guarantee? I'd go for the healthy and the established, right? Because that tree has already grown to a point to where it can be more resilient. Because we know that when we're establishing uh, any type of vegetation, that they naturally take more resources. It takes more water, it takes more energy, it takes more maintenance. It takes all of those things in the beginning until you get it in place. And then, of course, there's that ongoing maintenance that we're talking about. So what, the problem that we have in our industry is this cycle of remove, replace, rebuild, remove, replace, rebuild, remove, replace, rebuild. When you think about how often landscapes are completely flipped over, and then all of those costs, those environmental costs that we talk about with flipping them, um, that's huge. And then also when you think about the ecosystem services that can be provided, but they must be provided, um, or they're more likely to be provided when landscapes vegetation is allowed to live for a longer time, right? And when the maintenance of that landscape is considered very carefully so that you're always looking at the water impacts, the carbon impacts, um, the air pollution impacts, all of those things. So a really simple thing to do is to incorporate existing vegetation into the site. We've already talked about why you would do that. This is a Lake Filato project, one of my favorite um, architects, where they did some fancy, fancy work with the um, foundation so that they didn't damage the tree. Um, who wouldn't love to move into a house that had trees like that already established, you know, where the architect thought very carefully about how do you um, not only just miss the tree trunk, but you also miss the roots, <laughs> and you also project, protect the longevity of that tree. This is a tree um, in a development near, near my house here in Austin. And you notice that the architect was required to go around the tree, so good for them. But now look at what the landscaper is doing to the tree. Look at, they're storing their materials on there. They're turning up the tree roots. They're compacting the dickens out of that soil. And so yeah, the architect did what he was asked to do. He stayed out of it. It was fenced off during construction and all those things. Now we're turning it over. And I, I, don't, I don't know that we're doing much better there. So our industry can have a huge impact um, because of, of these sorts of um, situations. And it's not, it's not good enough to say, well, if this tree dies, they'll have to pay a fine, and um, then they'll have to plant 10 more, right? No, because if you look at the ecosystem service benefits of a, a five inch DBH baroque versus a 25 inch DBH baroque, and you think about how long it takes to get there, you can see that the difference in the benefits is huge. And then if, if that tree is only gonna live for 20 or 30 years before another developer comes in and cuts it down or messes it up or somehow it gets um, messed up during construction, then we're not getting anywhere. And so not only do we have to be very careful that the buildings don't damage our trees during constructions, but also our landscapes. I think it's important that um, we go ahead and we take the big jump and we begin to talk about eliminating potable water use after establishment from our landscapes. I know that's really scary in a climate like this. I get it, I garden. Um, I might, can I do this at my landscape at my home? No, but we are you know, regularly working towards it. And, and the reason we should care about this, and when I talk about this in different presentations um, across the country, I tell them, you know, in my region we have water shortages. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. But the other reason why you should care about uh, potable water irrigation in the landscape is because it has a huge environmental footprint. It takes a lot, a lot of energy to clean water and to move water. And so when you're thinking about the energy budget of your landscape or the environmental impacts of potable water, it's not just water shortages, it's, it's also energy. So when we're designing our landscapes, instead of designing it and then backing out and seeing how much water we're using, if we flip that and we say, okay, how much precipitation 
and on-site alternative water resources does this site have available? That monthly budget equals the monthly budget that we want to use in our landscape. And start from there and see how far you can get down that net zero potable water goal. And so there's all kinds of ways we can do this, really old technology, active rainwater harvesting, collect it now, use it later. Passive rainwater harvesting, which is bioswales, rain gardens. How does this help? Slows it down. What else is it doing? It's recharging the water and the soil. And then if you have organic matter in the soil and you have other in the right plant selection, then you have water waiting in the soil for your landscape rather than running off down the street. What about AC condensate? Any of y'all using AC condensate? There's a building outside that says this landscape uses AC condensate. Climates like ours, that can be a lot of water, a lot of really good water that typically runs at the same time that our cisterns are dry, right? Because our cisterns are dry because it's summer and it's not raining, but AC condensate, you have AC condensate because we're running our air conditioners. And so you can often combine your AC condensate with your rainwater and then use that to double up on storage so that you don't have to have two separate systems. And again, you know, this works for very large buildings like this. It can also work for um, very small residential buildings. Um, I'm surprised at how many homeowners don't know where their AC condensate water goes. It's typically dripping somewhere outside of their house. And if you can get to that water, it's a very good source of water. And then gray water. Texas is one of the seven or eight states across the United States that will allow you to use gray water. There is lots of issues around using gray water that we don't have time to go into now. But, um, and those issues are typically related with salt. Um, and, and so maybe we could talk afterwards or, or we can talk another time about how you would use gray water more effectively. But on any house that's pier and beam, where you can get easily to those pipes underwater where the, um, the, the pipes are not in concrete, the water outside of your bathtub, <laughs> the water outside of your sink, those sorts of things is just waiting. It's out of your shower, is just waiting for good use. And you know, when you're talking about salts, do you know um, two species commonly found in our landscapes in plethora that don't mind salty, salty water? Because they come from salty, they come from, um, yeah, um, saltwater ecosystems, more or less. St. Augustine and Bermuda. They just think about where they come from naturally, coastal regions, and there's more salt there. And so those two species are more likely to do well with, um, with gray water. All right, so lastly, the one we're really going to dive into today is um, soils. And I think soils is a resource that are often um, overlooked um, for many reasons. Uh, Sometimes I think because they're a little scary because it's chemistry and it's other things that not everyone is comfortable with. I know I, I'm not always comfortable with it. I've had to stretch my brain a lot to learn more about soils. But it is important that we protect and restore the ecosystem services provided by soils. Now soils are more than just mineral content, right? It's not just sand, silt, and clay, sometimes gravel. But there's also the organic matter in the soils, um, gases, uh, that, that interchange with the atmosphere above and that are also produced by uh, roots and soil biota within the soil and then the water and the water that's necessary for the chemical reactions. So why do we care about soils? Because there are specific ecosystem services that are related to just soils. Um, interestingly enough, um, managing stormwater on site um, is very closely related to drought protection and those two things um, uh, are connected to your soils. And so if a landscape can absorb rainfall, it mitigates flooding. We are a flood prone, prone region, as you all know. If any of your landscapes can reduce stormwater runoff, I promise you you're doing a greater good <laughs> for the entire community. Um, we talked about how soils, vegetation, soil biota, they naturally remove pollutants and they cleanse water. Um, the soil is storing plants, and not, I mean, storing water not only for plants, but also for wildlife, for us. Uh, it's providing nutrients and the nutrient cycle, um, storing atmospheric carbon, which we'll go into in a little bit more detail, and then also providing habitats for millions and millions of micros, insects, plants, animals, many of which we don't know enough about yet, but we're slowly learning that they are in a large part responsible um, or at least have a very strong connection to the success that we see above ground with our vegetation. So when you look at the earth, 
Uh, there are a series of carbon pools. The largest terrestrial carbon pool is soil. Um, how does carbon get out of the soil? How do, how do you increase the release of carbon in the soil? You turn it. Yeah, I mean, think about a compost pile, right? If you want, it to, if you want that to break down faster, you turn it. Um, so when we're grading landscapes, when we're turning soils, when we're moving soil around, we're increasing the likelihood of reducing that um, carbon pool within the soils. And I know there's many situations where it's difficult to avoid um, completely moving soil around, but there's also situations where we move soil around just be for an artistic license, right? <laughs> to, just to create different spaces and shapes. And so I'm just asking to think a little bit more critically about that. Um, interestingly enough, Tillman and others have shown that there is an increase in soil carbon sequestration um, when there's an increase in um, plant species. So a higher diversity plant palette is more likely to place more carbon in the soil. I think this has something to do with um, root systems. And you can think about if you have um, plants, a very low diverse uh, plant palette, then the root structure is also not going to be as diverse. But if you have many different species out there with many different root structures, then they're filling in all the spaces down below the soil and then providing more opportunity for um, root growth and then subsequently uh, storage, carbon storage. So a question for you. What is the most common constraint with urban soils in regards to ecosystem function? You got to pick one of these three. <laughs> but I think that's a good one. So what is the pH typically in urban soils? Is it acidic or alkaline? It's alkaline. Why is it typically alkaline? has to do with our water, but it also has to do with urban construction materials, primarily concrete. If you're measuring soils, the closer you get to concrete or where they've built concrete, you're probably going to see an increase in the pH. And that's because what is the basis of concrete? Lime. <laughs> yeah, limestone. So urban soils often have a higher pH. But the, the primary concern in urban soils is compaction. And so why do we care about compaction? Um, because it contributes to erosion. Um, it's restricting the plant growth. Uh, if it's limiting the soil's ability to absorb water and it's decreasing the soil's biological activity. So the roots and the soil biology both need the same thing to grow, right? They need air and they need water. When you compact soils, what are you squeezing out of the soils? Pore space, which is air. When water moves through the soil, where does it stay? In the pore space. So if you compact your soils, you're reducing the amount of air that's in the space. You're also reducing the space that is there to hold water. Um, and so you can look at charts like this. Uh, this is um, looking at the different type of soil textures. And so do all soil textures, should all soil textures have the same bulk density? The same level of compaction? No. Um, and the green lines that you're seeing here is the maximum allowable bulk density where uh, each soil texture becomes root limiting. So you'll notice that it's 1.33 at clay, and then way over here at sandy loam, it's around 1.66. That has to do with the particle shape and the particle size of clay and how much easier and how much uh, more compact clay can become than sand. And so you have to understand the soil texture type when you're working on soil so that you can know to be careful not to overcompact, but then also um, how to restore them if they do become overcompacted, and then how to measure them so that you can determine whether or not the soils are root limiting. So common causes of soil compaction, um, first and foremost, construction and maintenance equipment, um, repeated traffic, whether it be pedestrian or otherwise, rainfall on bare soils. It's really important to cover up our soils with mulch or vegetation or what have you in our urban ecosystems. Um, continually removing organic matter. Why, why would that um, increase soil compaction? Yeah. 
did you hear what he said? He said the best layer to that, that basically he's saying the organic matter um, and worms will will decrease compact soil compaction. So um, it's harder to compact organic matter in the soil. Like think about you take a a, a container worth of clay and you can take a con container worth of compost and you're going to compact those. If you had to build a house on one of those, which one would you pick? <laughs> right? You can't really compact that compost. You can't really compact that organic matter. And not that all of compost is organic matter, but a large percentage of it is. It's the same way in the soil. When you have organic matter in the soil, it protects the soil from compaction. And so um, in landscapes that are not getting uh, continual replenishments of organic matter, the organic matter content of the soil decreases over time, right? Because how does organic matter get into the soil, typically? Roots, leaves, plant materials, all of these things. If we go and we rake off all of the roots, <laughs> all, of, all of the plant matter that's feeding that soil, you're, you're robbing the soil of organic matter that it needs for all of these other ecosystem service benefits that we're talking about. So if that's part of a landscape maintenance regime, then you have to think about, okay, how am I going to replenish that organic matter on the soil? So how would you do that? You would mulch with compost. What do you think is going to turn into organic matter faster, compost or mulch? Wood mulch, compost. Um, is rock mulch ever going to get there? Yeah, not in our lifetime. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. And so thinking about the mulches that you select for your landscape, the maintenance practices and continually feeding that organic matter content, I think is very important. How do you determine the organic matter content of your soil? How? You have your soil test done. Yeah. And it's, it's something that I think should be done on a regular basis. Um, you're going to know your goal based on your reference ecosystem. Um, I usually shoot in this landscape for somewhere around 3 to 5 percent, somewhere. Um, that changes depending upon the plant palette and the amount of water that we're putting into the landscape and all of those things. But our native soils are somewhere in that range. What happens if you put too much compost in a soil? Can you put too much compost in a soil? I'll ask that. What does it do if you have too much compost in the soil? It's going to load your nutrients. What else is it going to do? It could increase the soil water pollution because it's loading the nutrients. It's also going to stay wet <laughs> um, because you're going to have a lot of, um, of, of ability to hold water. And then when um, we add carbon, uh, organic matter, not, don't forget I say carbon, when we add organic matter to the soil, um, does that stay there forever? It burns up, right? And what's burning it up? The soil biota. The soil biota, they're eating it, it's their food. Um, and so if you put, a lot, when you're putting a lot of organic matter into the soil over time, does it appear that that soil volume decreased? Does the soil shrink? Yeah, because it probably did, right? The organic matter was burned off. So you can have too much organic matter. Um, so thinking carefully about knowing where you're starting and where you want to go is very important so that you don't run into larger shrink, shrink swell issues and so that you also don't um, run into landscapes that hold too much water and then also the nutrient loading and pollutants that we were talking about. Um, compaction also comes from working wet soils. I know we all get pushed to do this because we're behind on a project, particularly in a winter like this where you can't seem to get uh, very many dry days, but there is a higher likelihood of damaging soils, working them when they're wet, and then also the repeated tillage. Um, so some design strategies for landscapes under construction. Uh, prior to starting construction, hopefully prior to starting design, you conduct a detailed site analysis um, and you develop a soil preservation plan. Which soils would you want to preserve? I would preserve the ones that I would define as healthy. And then someone asks, is there a universal definition of healthy soil? No. It has to do with the plant palette that you're anticipating going back in the landscape. It has to do with the program plan for the landscape, what, what you're going to do on that landscape, and also the local ecosystem. 
and how, how much you know you can benefit that soil by adding simple amendments like, con like compost. Um, so if you develop a soil preservation plan, then you select those areas that are to be preserved. You can protect them by enforcing tight limits of construction. Um, on my projects, we physically fence off those soils. Um, or you can designate, um, or in some places you can talk about soil harvesting, which we'll talk about more in a moment. Um, and then I think it's important, um, and hopefully the contractors in the room will appreciate this, um, to work with the contractor and understand that they have to get into that landscape. They are going to be using equipment. They do need spaces for material storage. Um, the soil management plan can't be something that I do by myself in a corner and then I hand to the, the contractor. It has to be a conversation where we have, where I always want them to use less space, they always want more space, and then somewhere we come into the middle with, with something that we can all agree upon. But very much, very, very, very important that they're part of that conversation. Uh, so when you can't fence off the soils that are to be protected, um, you can harvest them. When you harvest top soils, what do you do with them? You put them in a big pile. How big of a pile? Uh, they, they, the recommendations typically say no higher than about uh, four to five feet. So a bunch of you know seemingly big piles. Um, do you cover them up with plastic? No. What do you cover them up with? Do you cover them up at all? I would cover them up so that they don't blow or wash away. What would you cover them up with? A breathable fabric. What else could you cover them up with that might feed them? Mulch, Mulch compost, yeah. Um, what about, what should they sit on? Should they sit in water? What happens if they sit in water? They become anaerobic. You don't want anaerobic soils. Um, so you want to put them in a place we can have a bunch of small piles. You want to cover them up with an organic material that will feed them, a breathable material, because remember, you have microbes in there. You want them to keep them alive. If you want to keep them alive, you have to give them water. You have to give them air, which means you may need to sprinkle the soil mounds a little bit. And you also want to put them in a place where it's well-drained so that they're not sitting in water so that they don't become anaerobic over time. Um, soils that are going to have light, um, equipment across them, you can protect them with layers of mulch, very, very thick layers of mulch, coarse woody mulch. Think about that compaction. Using the lightest equipment possible, um, my specifications usually call for around four PSI, and contractors using equipment specifically that is around four PSI. Um, and then avoiding working soils when wet. I think the other important issue to talk about in our industry when it comes to soil is soil volume. Uh, this is a place where um, value engineering comes in, which is a funny term, which really means cutting costs, um, and soils are often cut. Uh, they're cut because who knows they're cut, right? So we see quality of soils being cut, and we see quantity, volume of soils being cut, and then we see a thin veneer of higher quality soils going on top, and then what's, what's left for the plants to grow in. And so we talked about how there is a direct correlation between the amount of soil volume and the size of a plant. We also talked about the amount of water that can be stored in a soil when you increase the organic matter. Um, and so you can begin to think about the size of your plants, um, how long you want them to live, how long your client wants them to be there, and then you can begin to justify why you need higher quality soils and why you need more soil volume. And as a typical rule of thumb, uh, you need a minimum of two feet of cubic soil per one square foot of mature tree canopy. Just something to think about when you're designing landscapes and you're, and you're arguing for these soil, soils to stay in place and not be cut. Um, moving away from soils and into maintenance, I see uh, the field of sustainable landscape maintenance as being a huge area for economic growth in the future. It's the direction in which we need to go. It's the directions in which, in which I push all of my clients to as best as I can. Um, and so what we're moving away from is scheduled maintenance that happens because it's March or April or September or what have you, to more adaptive maintenance. And this is a higher level of skill. And I think this is why you're in the room, right? 
you've committed to a series of learning sessions and improving your skills so that you can be recognized as being able to, to provide a better product. And this better product is adaptive land management, um, which is monitoring the landscape, looking at the needs of the landscape, and then determining the maintenance. Do, can you see how that's a very different approach? Um, and then another important thing is this continued learning and the feedback loops, which is absolutely necessary to improve um, our future work in the industry. This part's a little scary. Um, you have to go back, you have to monitor what you did, you have to see if it's working or not working. If it's not working, figure out a way to uh, improve it, and then be brave enough to go stand up in front of people or different scenarios and talk about what worked and what didn't work. Um, if you're looking at a system like the Sustainable Science Initiative, there is a credit for monitoring. I don't think the point value is quite high enough, but it is one that um, I really encourage my clients to go after because how are we ever going to learn if we don't monitor and if we don't talk about what we're doing? Um, but then also, um, it, it also, I think, when you stand up in front of people and talk about what you did and what you learned, you become a leader in the industry too. So it's a wonderful marketing tool for businesses out there. Um, I was asked to talk about a local sites project, and so I chose to talk about one that I think you may all be aware of, even if you don't know you're aware of it, because it's taking up a huge part of downtown right now, <laughs> all those cranes. Um, and it's uh, the University of Texas's medical district. The university, along with other partners, is building a new uh, hospital, um, teaching facilities, all of these things to bring a new medical school to downtown Austin on the existing campus. And so this was the site before construction. This was the site after we removed the vegetation, and now we're beginning um, with the buildings. So a couple of things that I'm proud of with this project is we are going to reach the 80th percentile um, for stormwater management, which means that we are going to capture and evaporate, infiltrate, or reuse our 80th percentile storm event, which is a little over one, per one inch storm um, inch um, on site. So from all that impervious surfaces uh, that are going on that, the large buildings, the large parking lots, the other things, we're going to capture that water and we're going to reuse it on site to the 80th percentile. This is a big deal for the university. Um, improving the function of Waller Creek is another one that I'm very excited about and very proud of for this project. If any of you have looked at Waller Creek, it's not a shining example of how we should treat our riparian corridors, yet it runs through the middle of Austin and influences so many folks, or could potentially influence so many folks. The University of Texas um, is the largest landowner of the Waller Creek watershed. And so this work that we're doing um, at the medical district hopefully will continue to creep its way up to the entire corridor through the university. And so as you might imagine, um, largely what we're doing is removing the invasive species and uh, that we see down in uh, that creek, which has not been an easy task. Um, for many reasons, we can talk about it more later, uh, but we are getting somewhere. We are gonna replace, of course, you have to fill a hole, right? You can't remove an invasive species and then leave the space empty because you're gonna get more invasive species back. Um, we're, we're filling that hole with then a native plant community. Um, we're restoring the damaged soils um, and we're greatly increasing the plant volume on this site, the plant soil volume. Um, we're increasing the biodiversity. We are moving in many areas to more of a meadow area, um, so many more native plant species going in. Once they get established, hopefully it will be greatly to reduce uh, maintenance as opposed from regular lawn mowing activities. And then important for the entire community, um, there's going to be a vast increase in the amount of access through this space. Trails and other bicycle pathways that link to other parts of Austin, you'll be able to go into this part of campus and move around and move through. So very exciting stuff. <laughs> 